Welcome to Screw the Commute, the entrepreneurial podcast dedicated to getting you out of the car and into the money with your host, lifelong entrepreneur and multimillionaire, Tom Antion. Hey, everybody, it's Tom here with episode 63 of Screw the Commute podcast. And wow, we have a unique guest on today. His name is Steve Olsher, and he's one of the few people that I even know of. I know some of the old old boys or the old guard, but has been online longer than me. There's very few of them, and uh, he's one of them. You're going to hear his story in a moment. Now, hope you didn't miss episode 62. My God, Becca Tibon was here. <laughs> she's, she's not only one of the hottest fit women I know for her age, She's one of the hottest fit women for any age. Right? You got to check her out. Her pictures are going to be in the show notes. You're just gonna you're gonna go crazy. This uh, woman is a poster child for uh, anti aging. Uh, one quick announcement: our podcast app should be ready soon. Uh, you'll be able to download the app uh, from the uh, app store, and you'll be able to do a lot of cool stuff uh, conveniently right from your mobile device. So I'll get more on that on future episodes. All right, today's sponsor is the Distance Learning School, the Internet Marketing Training Center of Virginia. Don't even think about retraining yourself or sending your kids to college until you check out our webinar on higher education. I do not want you wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars and putting yourself and your kids under crushing debt. And we'll have the webinar in the show notes at screwthecommute.com, and also you can just click on free webinars at screwthecommute.com. All right, let's get to the main event. Steve Olsher is known as the world's foremost reinvention expert. He's famous for helping individuals and corporations become exceptionally clear on their what. And that is the one thing that they were created to do. His practical, no-holds-barred approach to life and business propels his clients towards achieving massive profitability while also cultivating a life purpose conviction, and a contribution. Now, he's a 25-plus-year entrepreneur. He's the chairman and founder, <laughs> i got to laugh about this, of Liquor.com. And i got to spell that for you, <laughs> L-I-Q-U-O-R, in case those of you out there uh, didn't hear that correctly, Liquor.com. He's an online pioneer who launched on CompuServe's electronic mail in 1993, a year before I started uh, taken off on. I, I was on CompuServe, but I hadn't wasn't selling anything in those days. Uh, he's a New York Times best-selling author of What Is Your What. Uh, he's the author of a business technology book of the year, uh, Internet Profits: The World's Leading Experts Reveal How to Profit. Oh, wait a minute, online. Wait a minute. I don't remember being interviewed for that book. <laughs> <laughs> the heck's up with that? <laughs> Jeez. Oh man. Well, I guess we'll have him on anyway. He's the creator of the New Media Summit. Uh, hopefully he tells us about that uh, uh, here today. And he's the host of the number one rated radio show podcast, Reinvention Radio. He's an international keynote speaker and an in-demand media guest who has appeared on CNN, the Huffington Post, and the cover of Founder Magazine and countless other media outlets. Steve, are you ready to screw? The commute, <laughs> the commute that is I'm not that uh, kind yeah. of pod co -host, podcast host. <laughs> right. Uh, between that and liquor.com, I think we've got it all covered. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. You've been in it a long, long time. I was, uh, yeah, what I remember on CompuServe was a similar thing I paid for that nowadays is Google Alerts, but you could mm. get the CompuServe executive option or something. And I use that a lot in speeches to, uh, to put the name of a company in and I get all the news about them and then I use it during the speech. So, but those are, those are a long time ago, man. Mm -hmm. uh, I even remember when it, your, your CompuServe thing used to be a number. Remember that? <laughs> you, know, mm -hmm. like you could barely uh, remember anybody's uh, uh, way to contact them. But uh, yeah. tell us, uh, tell us what you're doing now, man. What's going on? So, you know, I've been doing a lot of things recently, not the least of which is, uh, well, Dancing in this uh, this world of podcasting, though I've actually been podcasting since 2009. But man, I've really just been going all in on this with the uh, with the event that you mentioned, the New Media Summit, and 
uh, continue to do a lot of writing and uh, and speaking around new media, uh, and more importantly, uh, just really helping others leverage the power of this. Uh, I, I think it's just a, an incredibly powerful yet greatly underutilized medium. So teaching them really how to to get into this space and uh, and then monetize the visibility that they're able to create through it. Yeah, and uh, I, I've only got into it uh, recently, and I, I used to poo-poo it because nobody was making any money. It was all, you know, ego stuff. But uh, nowadays, there's just so many outlets like uh, Alexa and uh, Echo for Amazon and the car, the new cars are able to listen to podcasts now. So, yeah, it's uh, you were you were smarter than me and got, in, got into it early, for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, not smarter than you necessarily. I just have always been one to kind of see the the writing on the wall there. And 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 I will tell you though, I'm I wasn't smart enough to stay in it. I mean, we did our first podcast in 2009, and then kind of danced around a bit and took time off and whatnot. So I didn't stay with it consistently. Uh, which God, I can't even imagine where our shows would be at this point. But got back into it uh, and have been consistent with it since 2015. Yeah, and that's I guess that's what everybody says is the. Uh... Uh, one of the keys to it, you've got to be consistent. People have to know what to expect from you, when and where and all that. So um, now 25 plus years as an entrepreneur, that's pretty significant. But that I know you're more than maybe 30 years old. So maybe did you have a job <laughs> at one time and the, the dreaded J-O-B? Well, definitely, definitely older than 30. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Over the years, I think I've done darn near anything known to mankind, I mean, including selling the speakers out of a back of a van at one point. But, you know, I've just always been wired as, a, as an entrepreneur from the time I was old enough to pick up a rake and move some leaves around and get paid for it. To, uh, I mean, even uh, grabbing a, a shovel, right, and then sh shoveling sidewalks and, and driveways. I mean, just Again, if I could rub a couple of dimes together and make a quarter, I was there. So, but that uh, yeah, really led to some interesting endeavors. DJed in a lot of clubs, uh, opened my own nightclub when I was 19, got involved in the catalog uh, world pretty early in the early 90s. Uh, and then that led to CompuServe's Electronic Mall in 93 and building a fully functional e-commerce site in 95, which became Liquor.com in 98. And then, uh, then all kinds of interesting stuff after that, real estate and uh, speaking and writing and teaching and doing live events and, uh, and so on. So yeah, a lot, lot of entrepreneurial endeavors over the years and, uh, and I'm just, I'm having, uh, having a ball. Yeah, me too. But I, I, you only said 25 plus years. It sounded like since you were a kid. You know, it's been, uh, <laughs> it, technically it's been longer. I mean, my, my first, I say 25 because at 19, that's when I opened up my nightclub. So I consider that to be like my real first endeavor okay. opening my club. And, uh, and technically I guess it's uh, longer than that, but then I'd really be showing my age. <laughs> well, I don't know if you know it or not, but I had a nightclub from 1980 to 1986. And that was an interesting time. Uh, it was in outside of Morgantown, West Virginia, after I got out of college and mm. <laughs> I was in two gunfights, a knife fight. Get uh, out of here. Oh, man, the bikers trying to kill me. I was in a, over 100 violent encounters with bikers. And, uh, oh, and man. Uh, they <laughs> shot up my car with shotgun blasts. And, it, uh, you know, it, it's like they say, anything that you don't <laughs> die from, you makes you stronger. And I recently rolled out a, a, a membership site called Brutal Self-Defense. So, <laughs> so thank God I lived. You know, in those days, uh, where was your yeah. nightclub? Uh, you know, interestingly enough, not a not really a dissimilar path. I did it off of the uh, just off of the college campus where I went to school in uh, Carbondale, which is Southern Illinois mm -hmm. University. So I spent uh, 26 years at uh, SIU and uh, then decided to open a club. But uh, no, that, that's where we did it. We just did it in Carbondale right outside of uh, Southern Illinois University there. Well, wait a minute. You spent 26 years. Were you like in the slow class or what, what does <laughs> yes, that mean exactly? exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> being, being a little facetious, but, uh, but let's just say, let's just say I took my, my time going through school. Well, I, I squeezed um, four years of college into five. So nice. that's, <laughs> that's <Yeah>. pretty good. <laughs> yeah. We were on similar yeah. paths then, but, uh, but yeah, that was, that was an interesting period of time. And, uh, I can't, sit here and say that uh, I was uh, shot at or involved in knife fights because uh, when that stuff happened, I guess you're just a big, well, you are a bigger man than I am. So <laughs> I, I, I would run away quickly. I'd be like, I, I leave that to the bouncers. Well, and, look, uh, that, that's why they get paid the big bucks. Look, being bigger than you, all, all that does is make me a bigger target for the gunfight. <laughs> so that doesn't really have a big advantage when you can't run fast. You got to fight. Right. So, yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> 
So uh, uh, what would you tell people that are out there uh, sitting in the cubicle thinking about, ah, man, those guys seem like they have the life. Everything's perfect for them, right? So, yeah, so, right. So uh, what would you I, tell I, them? I'd, I, I, well, I'd, I'd ask them if they have room in the cubicle next to them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, reality is it's there. There are plenty of days where I sit here and just think, you know, it'd be a heck of a lot easier to just go get a job. You know, <laughs> I mean, this this whole idea of inventing a paycheck, gets pretty old after a while. You know, it does, man. You know, you got you're just always on the hustle and the. The idea of somebody just saying, "Hey, do this and we'll pay you." I mean, that that's a pretty unique concept, right? So, the uh, but the reality is, you know, through the work that I do with the uh, with what is your what and really helping people understand how they're naturally wired to excel, and then because of my entrepreneurial background, I'm able to help them share and monetize that when they're clear on what it is. I would just simply say that step one is is really figuring out what puts fire on your soul, and, and once you're clear on what that is. It then becomes so much easier to figure out exactly what you can do, so that you can leave that cubicle if that's what you desire. Yeah, and some people, uh, you know, transition. They, you know, we never, you know, I know, I know, I don't. I'm sure you don't. Just tell people drop everything and don't have any money in the bank and just go, uh, you know, live your dreams. You know, it's it's a, a transition period. Uh, it is. A lot of people, if they're working for a job, they need to plan for this exit. Yeah, I mean, the way that, that I word it, Tom, is I just simply say, let someone else fund your transition. You know, it's just like, it's a lot of hours in the day. I mean, I think about all the hours I've been wrapping up lately and, and binging some of these series. You know, we're, we're, in, we're into Ozark right now and really digging on that. <laughs> but you, know, you think about that and Breaking Bad and Game of Thrones. And, you know, I, I don't know if you're a TV guy, but, you know, my wife and I enjoy our series. And so when you just think about the the monumental number of hours that people put into those things, it's like, my God, you know, just... Can you spend your time or can you invest your time? Those are really the questions. And we find that a lot of our time we're, we're spending. And so if you just invested some of the hours after work, before work, on the weekends into something that, you know, you truly are compelled to do, you'll find that, well, not only can you get let that day job fund your transition, but you'll get from point A to point B a lot faster if you really just are focused on where those hours are truly going. That's that's for sure. I, I try to tell people, use your throwaway time. I mean, i I wrote an ebook in four hours at a at a layover at McCarran Airport, and it's brought in three and a half million dollars so far. Get out of here! Yeah, and uh, and people say oh, that sounds like BS, but it's not. It's basically uh, you you write a book on how to do something, but they can't do it unless they buy the tool that's in the book, and you get a commission on it, and it's a residual. Mm-hmm. So so uh, yeah, that, but that was throwaway time. I wrote a thousand and forty two page book called Click. Uh, that was dominated the in- my industry for like 10 years. Uh, nowadays, that's too big. Nobody will consume it. That right. Big. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, even Harry Potter won't be writing yeah. books that are that big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so uh, that's throwaway time on airplanes mm-hmm. and waiting for your, your car to get repaired. Any of those things, you could be doing something productive that will get you out of that where you send somebody else to repair your car. So mm-hmm. now have you ever, mm-hmm. uh, uh, here's a rhetorical question. Have you ever gotten screwed over in business? <laughs> oh, man. You know, so you, you'll probably appreciate this. So uh, the answer is, well, for sure. And and a number as a matter of fact, I'm I'm so jaded at this point that I'm more surprised when people actually do what they say they're going to do. <laughs> I agree than, with like, that. Like, like, I'm just I, I don't know what it is. If it's, you know, it's growing up with a Jewish mom or I don't know whatever it is, <laughs> but it's like. I'm just always waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, where's the phone call? Oh, really? Okay, there we go. Like, yeah, I don't know, man. But more recently, one of the biggest uh, ways that I got screwed is I did, uh, as I said, real estate development for a number of years. Uh, and we developed about over $50 million in property over the years and had some some really, you know, big winners. And then some that got caught up in uh, that that crash that hit yeah. so many of us in the 2006, 7, 8, yeah, 9 period. Yeah. And um, so I had been doing larger development type projects in one of our larger developments. Uh, we couldn't refinance when the market fell out. Uh, we made a really dumb move and did something uh, that I wouldn't recommend for anyone who is into any sort of real estate development, which is basically turning a non-recourse loan into a recourse oh, loan, yikes. which is just about the dumbest thing you could possibly do. Um, but that happened because of just some really bad advice. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it happened during uh, a period of time where I had moved from Chicago, where the development was, to San Diego, 
And the same person who gave me that really bad advice that I thought was handling what was going on with that, what turned out to be a, a case, a lawsuit, uh, it turns out that he wasn't doing anything on my behalf whatsoever. A uh, plaintiff went in and got everything that they wanted as it related to that case, uh, including turning that recourse multi, multi million dollar loan. Uh, that was non-recourse into fully recourse uh, and ended up with a, a personal judgment against me for well over seven million dollars. That'll ruin that your whole day, Steve. I can ruin the that. whole day. Um, and reality is uh, it went even deeper than that because they were able to enforce that judgment against me here in California. And the only way that I knew that it was even going on was because they froze all of my accounts and seized my assets. Yikes, yikes, yikes. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm sure it turned into a massive learning experience for you. Could you just explain that term for people out there, a non-recourse and recourse? So basically a non-recourse loan is a, is a refer, well, I guess it could be for any industry, but in right. this case it refers to real estate. Um, the, the lender looks at it from the standpoint of we have this asset that we have a mortgage on. And so if push comes to shove, we can always sell the asset and recoup what's owed to us. And so we won't require personal responsibility, personal liability uh, on your behalf to take out this loan. So in other words, you get the benefit of the money to buy the building, but you have no personal responsibility because there's no liability tied to you personally. It's secured by the value of the asset. And so in this case, uh, it was a fully non-recourse loan, which means if the loan went south, I would have no liability on that debt. They would just simply take over the building and then sell it and recoup whatever they could. Um, but because of this move that was made, which was against the, the terms of the loan, which was unbeknownst to me at that time based on what we did, it triggered full recourse. So now I owed everything personally that was tied Yikes. to this mortgage. Mm. Man, that's... Uh... Yeah, so that's a couple of great lessons there. Be careful if you see that term, uh, a full recourse loan, and then also be careful who you do business with, too. I mean, my God, um, oh. if you'd have been there handling that, none of this would have happened. And uh, some, yeah. depending on other people, is, that's why I'm a big uh, – uh, and, and also another lesson here is a lot of people that listen to this show, Steve, think that, okay, well, I'm just going to make a little corporation or an LLC, and I'll be protected. Well, sure. these lawyers <laughs> laugh at that. They spend, they uh, charge you a fortune to set it up. And then a good lawyer will do what they call pierce the corporate veil. I mean, I doubt if anybody listening here is sitting and taking notes uh, each quarter with their, and pretending to be the secretary and board of directors <laughs> and doing yeah. all these things that really make you a, a corporation and have limited liability. So it's a, uh, uh, a, a fancy attorney. If there's a lot of money involved, that's that's a joke. You 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 wasted your money. But uh, good good lessons there. Sorry you had to uh, go through that, Steve. Yeah, I'll, I'll just simply say that you know there are lessons in life that I don't mind learning. This is one of them. I could have gone a lifetime without having to learn. <laughs> exactly. I right. would I would have been fine with that. that. <laughs> yeah, would have been fine. Or hear it about somebody else is a good way too. That's why yeah, people are that. on here for sure. So. Yeah. Um, Anything, uh, let's uh, flip that. Anything funny happened in the business for you or bizarre? Uh, well, you know, man, it's um, there, there's no shortage of, of those stories either. I will say that uh, perhaps one of the, the funniest things uh, that, that I've had to, uh, well, I've had the pleasure uh, of experiencing over the years is, you know, when we, um, when, when we had the, the catalog business, uh, it's, it's, it's a cutthroat business and, and I guess funny is a relative term as it relates to business, but and what was that? You know, what kind of business, what were you selling in the catalog? So we were actually, this was the predecessor to, uh, liquor.com. Oh, okay. So it was actually, so it was actually called liquor by wire at that point, uh, which is basically FTD for wine and champagne and spirits and gift baskets and so on. Um, but basically if you were in Virginia and you wanted to send a bottle of champagne to your buddy in LA who just closed a, a big deal, then you would call us and our local retailer would, would deliver that for you. So um, that was, um, that was the, the, the those, those days of, of catalogs, right? I mean, just before, I mean, it's funny now we were actually just watching a movie. My son and I were watching a movie called Boyhood, uh, and <laughs> the kids in the movie, 
Uh, we're looking at a Victoria's Secret catalog, and of course, get, getting their their giggles on yeah. the boys. We're sitting around chuckling at that, and you know, not that I would be a subscriber to that, but somehow, of course, everybody and their mother ended up with one of those in their mailbox. Right. And I was just trying to think about like when's the last time I actually saw a Victoria's Secret or or any sort of catalog at all, right? I mean, just other than res- restoration hardware, I guess no <laughs> one's really putting those out anymore. Or Uline, anyway, did you get that thick one from Uline? That's oh right, yes. <laughs> that's the that, only one. That, oh, and IKEA, right? I guess IKEA. Yeah, if you too, stack too. enough of them together, it'll stop a twenty-two bullet. Let me. T- <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <doubt that. laughs> But um, but, you know, interestingly enough, like I said, the, the catalog business was a really cutthroat business and we were running, you know, quite a quite a few books through that. And um, let's just say that uh, a lot of the, the bigger printers uh, that are not the R.R. Donnelly's of the world uh, are um, in kind of remote esque locations like Wausau, Wisconsin, exactly. and, you know, just the like, Midwest, you know, mostly. like exactly like mm-hmm. some smaller locations. Um, and let's just say that the, the, the way that they tried to earn my business, uh, would be frowned upon, uh, <laughs> today, <laughs> but, but, but back in the day, uh, you know, it was one of those just n- no holds bar kind of wow. approach to, we got to do whatever we got to do to get this guy to sign <laughs> up to the customer. And when you're out in the middle of nowhere, uh, evidently what happens in Wausau stays in Wausau. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. I never heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. So, um, so, uh, now I know my next question is already answered. What do you like best about working for yourself? Right. I know. <laughs> visiting Wausau. <laughs> yeah. Visiting Wausau. Yeah. Well, those, those days are long. I know behind, we better not let right? anybody hear this. It's uh, yeah. close to you. Right. So, right. Uh, but no, it's, um, I mean, look, reality is I, I have several multi-million dollar businesses that I run from my home office and I consistently work three days a week. So, you know, try to try to get everything done on a, on a Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday. What day is today, Tommy? Today, uh, I don't know. <laughs> they all it's run Wednesday. together when you're. Oh, right. yeah. no, it's <laughs> they think Wednesday. it's a Wednesday. Yeah, it is. It's a Wednesday, right? So, um, try to do every, everything as much as I can on a, on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and it's really just given me the the flexibility of being able to be home when I need to be home, being able to take the kids to school. I mean, I, I walked my kids to school nice. pretty much every day from the time that they were you know, in preschool up to the time that they were in uh, middle school. So being able to walk them to school and just hang out with them and coach uh, the flag football teams, the baseball teams, you know, the whole nine. Um, and of course, spend time with uh, my wife and and so on. So it's um it's been one of the the, the biggest benefits of of being an entrepreneur is just the flexibility of time. Is she a, a part of the business? She's not actually. No? My wife is a uh, she's a funeral director and embalmer. So <laughs> oh, no, you're kidding me, yeah. right? Yeah, you're not so, kidding me. No, not in the least. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, I guess if some of the, uh, I guess if some of the clients get out of line, then she becomes yeah, a part of business here, right? But uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Let, she, let's... she would love to hear this story. See, what before I, uh, after I got out of the nightclub business, I was telling, uh, I, I wanted nothing to do with nastiness and drinking and all these bums trying to kill me. And so I said, whatever I do, I'm going to have fun with it and the people around me are going to have fun. And I started a custom design practical joke business in Washington, D.C. And uh, long before Punk and Jackass and all those shows were around, it was called Prank Masters. We did 4,000 custom design practical jokes in all these years. But one, one of the things was a, uh, an over-the-hill preacher. So I would dress up like a priest, and I had these caskets that I found at a flea market, no less, <laughs> and I bought oh, them. Man. And I, I, I put them in a little um, uh, utility trailer, and I had a little Nissan Sentra, and I was driving on the Beltway in Washington, D.C., and I got these little funeral flags that said, Tom's Discount Funerals. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, <laughs> yeah, that's great. We did 4,000 jobs in there, that's, and that kind of kicked me off into the speaking business. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I never about... had an embalmer before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's what that's that's what she does. But talk about having fun with your work, man. That sounds like oh, a riot. Oh God, I was I was hysterically laughing. I wrote custom humor for six years straight every day, and uh, I really? delivered a thousand performances myself. And that's kind of where I got my comic timing for speaking and so forth. So uh, that's crazy. Was, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, <laughs> uh, I I reinvented myself. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, right. From a That's nightclub uh, near death to uh, to <laughs> to a jokester. So, uh, so what's the worst part about working for yourself? Well, you know, I mean, it, it's definitely the pressure of of having to take care of those who are counting on you to take care of them. I mean, you, you know, when you've got employees, I, I don't at this juncture and I haven't for um, eh, it's been it's been about five years since I've had a full time employee. But um, oh, really? Because uh, yeah, yeah. I got five and it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. pull my hair no. out half the time. Right. No, I haven't had uh, a full time employee now for for about five years or so. Uh, Part time type people help is needed. But, you know, reality uh, for me is that that the hardest part about it um, is just the the pressures of of having to, uh, you know, to, to cover the. The, the payroll and cover the the costs of, of just running a business, which means you just got to be out there selling. You got to be out there hustling. And, you know, it's kind of um, I mean, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting uh, dynamic, an interesting conundrum, so to speak, from the standpoint of, you know, as your business continues to grow, which is what we often want our businesses to do, which is grow, you have more responsibility and then more, you've got to be selling more. And it's like, we just keep adding to our expenses as our business grows, which means we've got to keep selling to cover those expenses. And it becomes this really difficult, vicious circle, right? And and the pressures of that, especially if you continue to grow, uh, often don't get any easier, but in fact get more complex when you get to more and more in, in so far as revenue is concerned. And so often, you know, this glamour of having a, a multi-million dollar business, you know, is one of the, it just quickly washes away when you realize that to have a multi-million dollar business, you've got to be generating multi-million dollars of revenue, <laughs> which yeah. means unless you've got the world's best funnels and things on automated and, you know, on, auto, on autopilot, so to speak, it's 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 a challenge. My goodness, Steve, I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, you may have to <laughs> to go to three and a half days a week to I know. work if things get bad. I'm, I know geez. things. Are, yeah, I know it's scary. Oh, Just will you, will you will you pray for me tonight? <laughs> I will. I don't. I'm already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So so uh, yeah so yeah it's, it's certainly it's up and down. But I guarantee you, you wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, you know, like I said at the at the outset of our conversation here, man. Believe me, there there are Indeed.com is an open tab right now on my uh, on my screen. So. Yeah, but uh, they'd have to pay a lot of money <laughs> to get you to sit in a cubicle. <laughs> I guarantee you that. I uh, know for sure. All for right, sure. so so tell uh, you know how people deal with you. What do you uh, I, tell us about this new media summit, and also tell us uh, about your definition of new media versus old media, and how you got sure. into all that. Yeah, well, let's um, let, let's start from the definition first. I mean, to me, new media uh, is the wave of what I would call pull media, which basically means that the consumer pulls the content uh, when they want it and, of course, what they want and on their preferred device. And so examples of pull media would be, well, like podcasting. I mean, this mm-hmm. is a perfect example, right? No one's forcing you to listen to this episode. You raised your hand. You downloaded the episode. You got it and you listen to it. So it's and it's one of the reasons why I'm so bullish on the medium, too, because, you know, people who listen to podcasts are, are much more likely to take action on a recommended product or program mm-hmm. or service. Right. And that same recommendation coming from email or social media or blogging, et cetera, uh, mostly because of the intimate relationship that takes place between the host and the audience. But also, again, because it falls under that category of pull medium where it's just like kind of the equivalent you'll appreciate this time i mean I, I liken it to the equivalent of a 100 email open rate and a one <laughs> and a 100 email click-through rate yeah, right? I mean, a, it's yeah, that and along with your unicorn farm you right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and so it's it's that powerful and of course other pull media uh, would be anything where, like Netflix, you know, where you pull the the content that you the content that you want, right? I mean, no one is forcing it on you, versus the the old media, so to speak, like regular television, ABC, NBC, whatever, where you turn on that channel and whatever is on is on. You didn't ask for it to be on. You can consume that content, or of course, you can just change the channel. But it's it's a push medium, like a newspaper would be a push 
medium, mm -hmm. right? Because you didn't ask for what's on that page. You're flipping the pages and you can continue to turn the pages or you read the article, right? So pull media is what I would call new media. And then push media is what I would refer to as old media. And what we did in terms of this event that you're referring to, which is called the New Media Summit, uh, is we created an event where we specifically focus on podcasting and teaching people how to leverage and monetize the power of podcasting. But specifically what we do with this event that makes it very unique uh, is we bring in 40 top podcasters who not only share their strategies and tactics and shortcuts for crushing it with the medium, but we also allow ample time for the 150 attendees, and we do limit it to 150, but we leave ample time for the 150 attendees to take the microphone and to literally pitch the podcasters on who they are and what they do and pitch everyone in attendance as well, and then pitch the thousands of people who are watching the live stream on, on who they are and what they do, and they get booked on the spot. So people come to the new media summit and they leave with bookings in hand on podcasts. That's great. And, and uh, there's a, a lot of details to this podcasting. When I got in it, I mean, I studied for four or five months before I rolled out because there's a crap in, in a couple hours on some of these uh, little apps they got. But boy, to do it right, yeah. you really, there's a lot of details and to market and monetize it. And uh, so do you get into, uh, what all do you go into at the New Media Summit? Well, we go into a lot of what you've you've mentioned. So we do go into how to monetize the visibility. I mean, I'm I'm of the mindset that every visibility opportunity is a revenue generating opportunity for you, right? So when you are a guest on a podcast or when you are uh, the host of your own show, uh, or even if you're featured on a blog or on a social media post or whatever, that should be a revenue generating opportunity for you. So a lot of what we teach is how to turn visibility into revenue and best practices around podcasting and you know what are future trends in terms of what's going on with the medium and everyone sharing best practices through panel discussions and small group discussions etc so it's a it's a mixed medium type of event as well with the pitches and the panels and the small group discussions and of course the the, the teaching sessions and so on uh, so we cover quite a bit of ground, but reality is people come out of there uh, after three days with the most important thing of all, which is real relationships with today's leading icons of influence, because there are no iron curtains, there are no green rooms, there are no VIP sections. Everyone hangs together, everyone eats together, we provide lunch, score my lunch every day for everybody, uh, we dance together, we learn together. So it's uh, it's really a relationship building event more than anything else. It, so, it sounds like uh, someone at any level could attend, right? If you were just yeah. thinking about doing a podcast, you couldn't be in a better immersive atmosphere uh, to get the, the story fast, I imagine. Yeah. So if you're thinking about launching your own show, you'll come out of there with, of course, bookings on shows, but also a really good understanding of what to do and why you're doing the show and how to best position your show to accomplish whatever that goal or objective is. Um, if you have no interest in starting a show, but you just want to get booked on shows, um, then, of course, you'll come there and you'll get booked on podcasts. Or if you have a podcast and you're looking to optimize the value of that asset, the value of that content, then you'll come out of there with strategies that could literally, I call it the six-figure shift. I mean, at, at any point in time, there, there's a six-figure shift waiting for you to happen at that event. Now, when is it coming up and is there any spots left? Uh, we do actually have one coming up in February, so February 21st through the 23rd uh, in the Tampa, Florida uh, area. Yay, uh, and then, warm. And, It'll be warm, warm. too. Yeah. There's a good and excuse then, to get the heck out of the north. Go down to Tampa to the New Media Summit. All right. Yeah, man. And then, yep. And then we do another one in September in San Diego. So take your pick, East Coast, West Coast. Okay. And uh, you still have room for the uh, Tampa? Uh, we, we do. I think we've got about 30 seats left right now, somewhere right in there, about 3-0. Yeah, because people, when they when you announce the dates, people flock to this because, uh, you know, the, the value here and the get, you know, all of those podcasters. I know, even with myself, and uh, you know, I know a lot of people. It's, you know, it's pulling teeth to get uh, even get to some of the people I know because they're so busy. Uh, so this is really a great opportunity. Uh, for for people out there, if you want to get into podcasting, and I don't know of any better better place than this one. 
Um, yeah, thanks for that. And where do uh, where would they go to to check it out? Um, well, easiest place, of course, if you just want to learn about the summit, uh, is the New Media Summit website, which is newmediasummit.net. So newmediasummit.net. And, um, you know, if you're just interested in connecting with podcasters, uh, that's something we can help with, too. And maybe we can talk about the Ultimate yeah. Directory of yeah. Podcasters. Uh, after the break, we're going to uh, sure. uh, give them, a, give them a bunch. you got a lot of great resources for people here, probably more than anybody that's uh, been on the show so far. And all of them are top notch because this guy, like I said, he's uh, he's been around the around the pike. We're going to take a, a just a brief uh, message for our sponsor, and when we come back, we're going to ask Steve what a typical day. Maybe we'll ask him two 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 typical days when he's working and when he's not working, and how he stays motivated. All right, so I want to tell you about this uh, what colleges and universities are doing, folks. I mean. According to gradeinflation.com, they're raising grade point averages to make it look like they're doing a better job of teaching when there is a mountain of evidence that they aren't. I want you to really watch the eye-opening higher education webinar at screwthecommute.com. Just click on free webinars and potentially save yourself and possibly your loved ones, friends, and neighbors hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt when they go for higher education. Also, if you decide an internet career is right for you, imtcva.org will finance, that's Internet Marketing Training Center of Virginia, will finance your education with no credit check and zero interest. You can check it out at imtcva.org. It's a distance learning school. It's asynchronous, which means you can study anytime, day or night. You don't have to show up at a certain time, so it fits perfectly if you're still working at that Dreaded J-O-B, and that will be in the show notes. This is episode 63. All right, let's get back to our great guest. Uh, Steve Olsher is here. He's uh, been in the game uh, longer than me, and I very few people can say that. And He's uh, had his ups and downs like we all have, and he's uh, brought some great tips uh, for us. But uh, I want to see what his uh, lifestyle is like a little bit more. So, Steve, what's a typical day look like you for you when you said you worked like Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday? So, in those days, and then when your day's off, I mean, can you can you completely divorce yourself from a, those multi-million dollar <laughs> visits? I mean, who are you kidding? Right. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Are oh, my, Tuesday, my Wednesday, Thursday. Day. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I like the idea of four day weekends. Okay. <laughs> um, so, it, it, look, you know, when I'm when I'm at it, I'm at it, and whether it's creating content in terms of emails that are going to go out to my list. Well, what or time do you get up? What time you get up in the day? And what's it look like? Uh, yeah, you I'll put it to you this way. You take to school too, right? Yeah, you know, when, uh, when when the kids are out of school, uh, even on a work day, it could be 8.30, 9 o'clock on a wake up. When the kids are in school, eh, 7.45, something like that. I am not one of those early riser yeah, kinds either. of, kinds of guys. Really. Um, so... You know, obviously get up, try to try to yell the kids out of the house if, uh, you know, if they got school that day and uh, and then just dig into interviews. I, I, I try to do it's funny because out of, um, you know, out of all the things that I've tried over the years in terms of marketing and, and you can probably relate to some of the old school things that we've done, like buying keywords yeah. and, <laughs> you know, and, and, and of course, SEO and blogging. And all. I mean, like out of all the things that I've done over all the years there's nothing more effective in terms of being able to generate highly targeted leads and getting folks interested in your products, programs, or services than what happens when you appear as a guest on a show. So outside of, you know, a very small number of Facebook ads, the only marketing that I do is appearing on shows like this. And so in the last three years, I've, I've appeared on over 500 shows. Um, yeah, and, and this so kind of show is great because I've, I've done a lot of TV in the past. What a hassle that is. I mean, right. you know, if I have to go to New York for a TV appearance, it's a thousand bucks right there, plus one or two days shot and, uh, and just craziness uh, to do it. And you could get bumped. You know? so, yeah. so this is infinitely better. That's why you got to get to that new media summit. All right. So, yeah. so that's your marketing stuff. It is. And, and, and by the way, I look at I look at podcasting and these sort of uh, opportunities here as as like free stages. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. thousands and thousands and thousands of free stages right. are waiting for you to share your mission and your message. Right. So so on a typical day like today, I think I've got 
three interviews that I'll do. And outside of that, I'll do so we have some year long type programs that we have. So uh, like this morning, we did a, a group coaching call for for some of those folks. I'll do some one on one stuff for more of the elite type clients. Um, and, uh, and, and realistically is I've got to create my own content as well. So on Thursdays, uh, we create, uh, the content that we do for our shows, reinvention radio, uh, and beyond eight figures. So we actually do it as a live radio show. So we do one hour of reinvention radio and then one hour of beyond eight figures. Uh, and that takes place, uh, on Thursdays. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, how do you stay motivated with all this stuff? You know, it's interesting, man. I um, It definitely ebbs and flows. And I, I've been in kind of what I might call like a, a, a coasting mode, if you will, for a while already. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> really, really, when you come right down to it, I've kind of been in, in coast mode now for the better part of almost, almost 10 years. Well, you got kids yeah. stuff and you're coaching and doing all kinds of good stuff that yeah. you're allowed to do because you got the income. Yeah. And realistically, for me, it's just kind of sharpening the saw. Uh, and that's what keeps me motivated is sharpening the saw on on. And, and for those who are not familiar with my work, I teach something called the seven by seven model, um, which are basically the seven things that I do to fuel our seven figure plus businesses. Right. So there, there's only seven things that I do. So for me, it's really just sharpening the saw on on one of those seven things on a consistent basis. that keeps me motivated because there's always room for improvement. Yeah, that's for sure. Now, uh, you've got a lot. There's so many freebies you have. I don't know what to pick from, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I I did download one of your things that was like uh, 2.7 million podcast hosts. Yeah, By the time I got done reading it, I was like, I had, you know, my eyes were sore. I had a headache, <laughs> but, but I never saw such a beautifully produced free document that was freaking amazing and that's the yeah. i really appreciate high quality work when people put out stuff that's that good and free you know that they come through with high value and all their other stuff so so tell yeah. them uh, uh tell them some stuff they can get from you to get started and uh, also uh, give us when you're done with that i want you to give us some parting thoughts for uh, we call them our screwballs uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> who, uh, mm -hmm. who are listening to this and uh, they want to they want to get out there and, uh, and be an entrepreneur so yeah. uh, go to it. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate that. So it's not 2.7 million. It's close. Uh, <laughs> but what you're referring to uh, is we have a, a free directory that we put out, which is called the ultimate directory of podcasters. So if you've been wanting to get to, to be a guest on shows and you just didn't really know how to connect with folks, uh, the ultimate directory of podcasters gives you detailed contact information photos, name of the show, description of the show, website, and even the email address. Uh, of 670 top podcasters. So that is the ultimate directory of podcasters, detailed contact info for 670 top podcasters. Uh, and we do give that away. So you can get that at myultimatedirectory.com. So myultimatedirectory.com. That's uh, a great place yeah, to go. And, we'll have, and, that, um, uh, yeah. we'll have that in the show notes for everybody. And I got to mess with you a little bit here. You yeah, know, here's no the thing. Here's the thing. So I'm looking through this thing. My eyes are getting crazy because there's so much, so many resources there. But then every category, Steve's face pops up. It's like, okay, ballet podcast. Oh, there's Steve. <laughs> Come <laughs> <You know>? on now. <laughs> not, not every category. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost. All right. Yeah. But no, it's it's an amazing, amazing resource. What's it? What is it? My ultimate what is it? Yeah. Yeah. My ultimate directory.com. My ultimate directory.com. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so what else? Well, what are we going to do? We're going to create a director and we're not going to put reinvention radio or beyond. No, eight figures I in think it. it's Come beautiful on, marketing. I've just, uh, so I, I don't know if he's a ballerina. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, what else you got for him? And then, uh, let's get some parting thoughts for him. Um, yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about uh, just if you're in that cubicle and trying to figure out what the first step is. I mean, for me, it's always the first step of being able to answer the question of what is your what? Uh, and so if you're curious in terms of what your core gift is and what the primary vehicle is that you'll use to share that gift and then who the people are that you're most compelled to serve and you think the what is your what framework uh, can help you with that, which I know it can. Uh, we do give away a free copy of that New York Times bestseller so you can get the whole book. 
uh, at whatisyourwhat.com. So whatisyourwhat.com uh, is where you can go to pick up a free copy of that entire book. Yeah, we'll have everything in the in the show notes. Uh, oh, Steve, it's great uh, crossing paths with you again after all these years. Uh, and uh, wow, yeah, you, just a, a, a mountain of resources. And that New Media Summit, I'm telling you folks, 30 slots left. Uh, get on it because uh, uh, what's the address for that again? Yep, newmediasummit.net. Newmediasummit.net. Because if you want a, a super, super, um, it's like, uh, it reminds me of those uh, drag cars that have nitrous. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> compared to, you know. Nitrous oxide. Yeah, you walk in that door and now you got to practice your pitch because I've heard some pretty lame pitches. <laughs> You don't want to blow your chance. You have any yeah. ch- training helping yeah. them with that? They got to yeah, be concise. Actually, they got to get the yeah. message. Yeah, just give them a couple tips on making a good pitch. Yeah. So one <clears> of the <throat> things that we do that I think does make our event unique is we actually do four pre-event training sessions oh, to really beautiful. help people to really help people get dialed in. And we actually create a media one sheet for you as well as one of the bonuses there too. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just super important to be able to, to use the time that we're giving you. I mean, we, like I said, we literally hand all 150 people the microphone so that they can get their, their time on stage to pitch everyone. So being concise, being intriguing, as my friend Sam Horn says, you know, being able to pass the eyebrow test where people kind of raise their eyebrows and go, hmm, that's mm. interesting. I want to I want to hear more about that. Right. Mm-hmm. So it, it's definitely a skill, but it's a learnable skill. And uh, and, and reality is we have a 100 percent track record of people coming to the summit and getting booked on shows. So I'm really, really proud of that, uh, where, uh, again, everyone who comes to the summit leaves with bookings in hand. Uh, and actually, some of the folks leave with a lot. We had one woman who left the the last summit with 33 bookings. Wow. So uh, it, it does. It, you know, look, if you need more visibility and eyeballs and eardrums on your mission and message, and who doesn't, uh, why not get it for free? And that's that's what happens at the summit. Let me tell you, folks, just getting 10 bookings <clears throat> is not easy, even if you got a reputation, because just getting to people and now they're all going to be there in one place, just amazing. So it's newmediasummit.net, right? Yep, you got it. There we go. Steve, thanks so much for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, I know everybody's going to uh, going to take a look at that hard and, and get all your resources. And, uh, hey, I'm glad we could uh, we could uh, hit it together. Yeah, man. No, I, uh, you're, you're definitely one of my heroes, dude. I've got nothing but love for you and admiration. I've seen what you've done over the years. And believe me, you guys are in good hands here with Tom, and I'm glad you're doing the show. Oh, my, my pleasure. All right. So... Uh, next episode, folks, is 64. That's how the pursuit of excellence uh, can really skyrocket your business. And if you're new to podcasts, please uh, subscribe and review. We're on all the major places. Go to iTunes. Or if you don't know how to do that, we have instructions for you at screwthecommute.com. Check out all Steve's stuff, and I'll catch you on the next episode. <laughs>